you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. You um, I uh, was asked by Diana if I would come here tonight and interview her, and um, I said yes right away. I would be honored. Later, I thought about it and <clears throat> about the real introvert that I am, but then I realized I was with a wonderful extrovert, so we would have a fantastic evening. Um, so. It's a special night because I know a lot of uh, people in the audience um, here are people you want to acknowledge. So let's, um, let me ask you about what it was like to walk up on that beach. You know, the eccentric thing, perhaps, and I'll admit to it, it was an ego thing that in all these years, I mean, how many times we all love a story, right? And I got to live an epic story. This dream started 35 years before at the age of 28. And through all of that training and the attempts at this thing, five attempts, often just to pass the time during all the long hours of training, I would think of what would be the oration I would make if I ever made it to that shore. <laughs> what would be those, you know, poignant words? I was thinking of Browning, maybe, you know? <laughs> your reach should exceed your grasp and whatnot. But it didn't happen that way. I was mm. stunned, um, quite obviously physically, but emotionally. It always occurs to me when you see Roger Federer win Wimbledon and he goes to the grass and cries, mm. It's not because he won that match. It's because of all the years, all the dreaming, all the people involved. And here, it was a saga of almost dying, literally no hyperbole, to the box jellyfish in one attempt. It was the hundreds and hundreds of hours of solitary training. And it was the unwavering belief that I and my team had that one day, Failure after failure after failure, we would actually see those lights, see those palm trees, and walk up on that shore. So I didn't ever rehearse those words. Mm -hmm. I never thought of them before. They came out in a very um, organic sort of moment. And I think the reason they came out, never, ever give up. You're never too old to chase your dreams. And it looks such a solitary sport, but it's a team. The reason they came out, Marcia, I think in that authentic way, was that those were the precepts that I was living out loud during all of the quest. So I can remember the moment, you know, it, it, it was wonderful, it was only two years ago, but the truth is, what I got from the entire experience was much more the journey and the, the, the noble friendships, and the science, and the history, and that particular ocean, the bond with it all, than I did the moment of the victory. Mm -hmm. Certainly reading the book for me, it's um, my <clears throat> greatest acting teacher always said it's either love or fear. Mm. And so I was looking at it that way, and, and it's such a story about so much love and friendship, and, and how all that interplays with your quest. But I mean, even being around you through all that, I really didn't know the extent to which your team, you know, that it is a team sport. And reading the book, it really, I mean, I certainly know Bonnie, and I never thought you could do it without Bonnie. Personally, that was just because I know the two of you, and I feel like she has the strength and character of you in her own way, and that you are such a match. Um, in fact, one of my favorite <laughs> lines in the book was when you were talking about your mother and you said something like, um, basically that she didn't miss a day visiting her. And I just stopped and I wept because I thought that's like, that's <clears throat> the most beautiful 
thing right there. Forget about everything else you've been through together. I mean, the friendship that I've watched you both have. And then to find out about Candace, and just all the years and th that you've spent with these people. I mean, it's just the most beautiful love story, in addition to the, you know, the event, like you said, in and of itself. And um, I certainly was one of those people who, um, when you left that third time, I think it was the third time, and I met you at the coffee shop. I went because I didn't know that I was ever going to see you again. I'm, so, I'm like, I'm Barbara Walters up here crying. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, I should ask you a question. Well, it, <laughs> That's well, what I'm supposed is. to do. It is, and everything is, isn't it? All about the people. Yeah. You know, if, if you stood there alone and you didn't take this journey with anybody, what would it all mean? So... You know, Bonnie um, was the rock of the expedition. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm pretty tough, need I say, but, um, <laughs> but you are brought to your knees out there, and even some days in training, you know, you could do a 15-hour swim, and that night you're vomiting on the bathroom floor, and you wind up in the fetal position, trying to compose yourself, and and keep yourself together and, and then, you know, you blink and you're out for a 16-hour swim and then a 17-hour swim. And some days, Bonnie would bring me close to the boat. We didn't have to talk. And she'd put her hand up like this. And childlike, she'd say to me, do you have five strokes left? I know there's a drop of courage somewhere deep within, and you don't believe it now. You're done, you're spent, but I think you have five, not five minutes, five strokes left. And I would look, say, I, th I think I do, and I would take five little feeble strokes, and I'd look up thinking I was gonna get this applause for that <laughs> Herculean effort, and I'd see her like this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how it is in life? You feel great, you're on top of the world, and you got the tiger by the tail, you don't need anybody, you're coasting, and then wham, the unexpected happens, and you unravel, and you need your family, and your friends, and your colleagues to believe in you, and help you take those baby steps until you have hope and you start going up the next side of the next mountain. So five after five, and then pretty soon, an hour later, I've got my strength back. Bonnie's here tonight. Bonnie. Bonnie and I, at some point during, before the victory, we got matching tattoos. And if you think I'm tough, I cried. I mean, I was biting a towel in pain through this whole tattoo. Um, but it says ish indention. So we got little matching tattoos. And uh, that means in Japanese, one heart, one mind. And it means really you don't need to talk. There are no words you need. And Bonnie reminds me now that we really don't need to talk so much. You know, at this stage. You mentioned Candace. Candace yeah. is the only person who was on my boat all five times, going back to 1978. Um, <laughs> Candace is a, um, an historian of women's sports, and she's, uh, you know, a, 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 what can I say, a soulmate. And so to have, and you'll see the dedication of the book, um, to have these two epic friends do an epic journey with me, mm. you know, you, you can't do any better. And I have a, I don't have a big family. I have a small family, but I have an in, intense love and closeness and mutual respect with my family. Mm -hmm. And my sister, Lisa's here tonight. Lisa. There's Lisa over there. Mm -hmm. 
Lisa was part of my team, but we, we, we go, you know, into an intimacy of taking care of my mom through Alzheimer's, of, you know, a childhood that was um, uh, pretty, I'd go so far as to say, terrifying in a lot of ways. Uh, our home wasn't a safe place, and Lisa and I forged that bond when we were just kids together, and it's still there. When we look in each other's eyes, we say, what, whatever you need, I'll be there. And um, Lisa was, was part of my team, and I'll always remember you for that, Lisa. I had trouble with... Um, men. I had two abusers when I was little. And when Lisa's first child, Tim, was born, and I held him in my arms, that little chubby, he asked me not to make the joke anymore that when I saw his little penis, <laughs> he'd prefer I refer to it otherwise. But, but seriously, I think it was the first time that I, I truly sort of woke up to the fact that half of the world is male, and there are some beautiful men in this world, and Tim's the first one I knew. Mm -hmm. And now to see, you know, it's an unusual thing in sports, right? You're young. It's maybe the tragedy of sports that you retire young. I mean, we talk about Peyton Manning now as, oh, that old, <laughs> you know, he can barely walk. He's 39, <laughs> you know. Um, so you retire young, and here I was back in the world-class you know, arena of sports at the in, in my 60s. And so, except for Candace, the other closest people in my life, Bonnie and Lisa and Tim, they hadn't been involved in my athletic career mm -hmm. before. And now for us to be in it together, it was unusual. Mm -hmm. And Tim, I don't know if you've seen it, but Tim is a, um, he's a, a master filmmaker, he, California, Berkeley, J School, you know, star, but he made The Other Shore, which has been a, a, a big success on Showtime. And, um, and he, he continues to win awards with his filmmaking, but he also, on this swim, when Bonnie couldn't be there, or even when Bonnie was there, he, if I was in trouble, dropped that camera. He, he, was, he was in it. He was in it the whole way, and we'll always have this to share. Tim is right over here, Tim Wheeler. Yeah. And the last, um, I just mentioned the last member of my team who's here tonight is Tim's wife, KJ, Karen Christensen, who uh, rolled up her shirt sleeves every minute of the way. And when she first came on a training swim, it was Mexico. And it was a rugged, awful day. It was just wind was whipping. They were worried about me being thrown up onto the reef all day. We couldn't go outside the reef because it was so darn windy and the shark issue was happening out there. And Karen decided it was the very first swim that she, and, and it was kind of a crisis all day, that when I would come in toward the boat for, you know, feedings during the day, that she shouldn't talk to me. And, um... Uh, you know, just she wasn't quite sure what to say and should stay out of it. And then it calmed down. There were only two hours to go, and it was much nicer, and we all felt proud of ourselves. We made it through the day. And I did come over to the boat for one last feeding, and Karen felt she could talk to me, and she said, I'm just curious, are you, are you thinking about the meaning of life out there? <laughs> you know? And I said, I do, you do go there, because you're, you're in this, you know, you're immersed in this blue jewel of a planet of ours. But I said, but, but frankly, just now, the last two hours, I've been singing the Beverly Hillbillies theme song. <laughs> you know, just over and over, come listen to a story about a man named Jet. And so um, that was our first live connection. But Karen's here tonight too, she's right there. And you know what, Marsha, um, a couple of things. First of all, I will never, ever forget that second night. I was hanging on by a thread. I was cold. You know, you're, you're in a state of sensory deprivation out there. You know, I have such a high regard for the, all of the world's extreme adventurers, the, the alpine climbers, the people who run across the Kalahari Desert, and they all have different issues, different hardships. But one of the issues for me is 
that you don't have your sight and you don't have your hearing. You are really in your own world and you've got to use discipline and focus to stay in it and, and know what you're doing. And that second night, this was a 53-hour swim, and that second night I was uh, shivering, my hands were down by my side, and Bonnie, we usually have a cardinal rule, we have a 44-person team. You've got the jellyfish experts, the shark expert, the navigation team, the, the, the medical team, and, and Bonnie is the head of the, the handler team, and they don't tell me where we are, because mm -hmm. God forbid from, from the boat you see a, a GPS reading and say, oh, uh, the, the, the final beach is gonna be 110 miles, where well, we're 78 miles now, we're almost getting there. Well, a million things could happen, from currents to sharks to, you know, whatever, to my own debilitation, so until we're really right there, you know, nobody tells me anything, but Bonnie knew I was in trouble. She made an executive decision. She blew the police whistle, means you stop. Everything you're doing, dog paddle over close to the boat, and she said, turn around and look that way. Tell me what you see. My vision was so poor, I couldn't see anything. I just saw black on black on black. The sea was black, the sky was black, and she said, no, 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 look. Look again, tell you there's something out there. What is it? And I sort of feathered up, I was looking, I said, oh, there was a little white horizontal light in the middle of the black. And I said, the sun's coming up. I'm gonna be able to take all the jellyfish gear off. It's so darn difficult to swim with. The sun's rays are gonna warm my body. And Bonnie isn't much of a crier. Wait a second. <laughs> Sometimes she is. <laughs> but she cried yeah. and she said, it's better than the sun. I thought, better than the sun? <laughs> she said, those are the lights of Key West. And that was, uh, for the whole team, it was a high emotion. And we, you know, uh, that, that's the vision I wouldn't give up on. For 35 years, I pictured that, even though I had 30 years of retirement in the between. Uh, there was a, that Cuba dream was always fluttering in the back of my imagination. And uh, there they were, the lights mm -hmm. of Key West. Although, you know, actually, they weren't right there. <laughs> it turned out we had about 15 more hours to swim after that vision, but um, we, we pretty much knew we were gonna make it if we just stayed safe from that point. Um, I forget what you asked, but you know. <laughs> I'm only here because I knew I wouldn't have to ask much. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I met you at a time when you weren't swimming, mm. and um, reading your book, I think it was your 50s, because I'm really bad with time, but mm. which is where I am now. Mm. Um, and I always think, you know, I, I was telling you that it's always the headline, the success story, that, you know, when you finally, I don't know, do something remarkable like you did, or when life is going well, that everybody, you know, is there for you. But uh, that was a hard time in your life. And um, I guess what's interesting to me is going out of that into, you know, that moment. Like, because I go through them in my life all the time. I'm, I'm just not one of these, like, from one thing to the next to the next, and life is great. I always have to go crashing down, lose all my confidence. You know, I just, it's just how I am. And so I'm interested in asking you about what that, you know, I know the story, but talking a little bit about what that was like for you to... You know, I think in some ways, like how can I complain? I had a broadcasting and sports journalism career that, you know, was rather esteemed. It was national public radio. It was all at a national level. Since I was a kid, I wanted to say the thrill of victory <laughs> and the <laughs> agony of defeat. And that was my very first job. I didn't start at a local, you know, television station and work my way up. And so, you know, how can I complain, as I say, to, you know, travel the world and follow the, the best pursuing their excellence here and there? But the truth is, by the time I hit my 50s, that career went from 30 to 60. I, I, um, I don't know, I, I was feeling the malaise of a spectator. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that some journalists they're creating great work. A lot of sports journalists were never athletes, and they're not feeling that they're, they're missing something, that they're not doers. They are doers by what they create, their words, their, you know, their actions. But um, I don't know. I, 
I, I was feeling just tremendously lost that I was not a doer anymore, and I'm, I'm just a doer. Mm -hmm. And my mom died, Lisa and my mom died, 2007, and I turned 60 in 2009. And it wasn't a matter of, um, you know, aging. Yes, I do think that you get more of a grip uh, around the throat at 60 than you do at 50. Uh, there, there's a, and your, your mom just dies, there's a vision of you are really on this one-way street we're all traveling. Uh, you are closer to the end, certainly, than you've ever been. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even a matter of, let me get out the ledger. Have I made some money? Um, have I, you know, been inducted to any Hall of Fame? It was, it was deeper than that. It was a, the fabric of self-respect. Am I the person I can admire? And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm not much of a poetry person. I, when I read a poem, I say, why don't you just say it? <laughs> why don't you use some more words, you know? But I had read some Mary Oliver through the years. It was the one poet. I don't know if you all are Mary Oliver fans. Yeah, just genius. I had read The Summer's Day a couple of times, and I had read those last two lines of The Summer's Day a couple of times, but not to a way of I thought that, that, that it was my sort of, uh, you know, muse and helped me through life. I just remarked that it was, you know, very well put. And when I turned 60, I thought I needed those two lines, and I didn't know how much. I went rummaging through my little library. I found her poem, and if you know it, those last two lines, and I needed them. Tell me, what is it you're doing with this one wild and precious life of yours? And I was just seized with an existential angst of it's one life. You never get to do this day over again. And I thought, I want to live at large. I. I I'm going to go back and chase that Cuba dream that was always, to me, more than sport, more than an athletic achievement. It's clearly all those things, but it's chasing a star, mm. the browning star that you may never grasp, but the reach, the effort, the journey is going to make you feel alive and awake. And in fact, it did. And it all came down to, is it about the journey or the destination? And at first, the destination seems so clear. We're just going to train 2009, 2010, or swim over, walk up on the shore, and that's going to be a great life experience. Mm. And then we failed, and then we failed again and again. And it came down to, you have to examine, is this journey still worth taking, even though the destination is seeming more and more elusive? And it was. Mm. Now, would it have been forever? Um, there were people that didn't want to go that fifth time who CNN dropped out. They had been, um, you know, thought that it was an inspiring uh, story that they followed carefully. And they said, you know, it seems that you're going to be 90 um, <laughs> and still trying this swim. So I tell you what, if you ever make it to the other shore, we'll be there. Mm -hmm. um, Tim had invested so much time, heart, and energy and for his film. He just couldn't put more resources and another full year into it. And um, we all understood that. Uh, Dr. Timothy Noakes, who's the greatest sports nutritionist uh, on the, in the country at this point, he taught Bonnie, instead of feeding me just compressed gels and goos like a marathon runner might take, this is longer. You're immersed in a water temperature colder than your body temperature for two and a half days. You're, you're trying to digest in the supine position so that all that nutrition, much of it doesn't go into your, your digestive system for your muscles to contract. It goes into empty spaces. Um, there are just a number of eccentric hardships out there that, that make it a, the glycogen deprivation. You can never keep up with what you're spending. It doesn't matter what you eat and drink, you are losing all the time. And Dr. Noakes taught Bonnie to feed me real food come over to the sea. You can't ever touch the boat. You can't get out on the boat, but you come close to it. And Bonnie would take handfuls of pasta, a plain cooked pasta, and I would just open my mouth <laughs> and she'd drop it in. That's right. There's a job waiting for me at SeaWorld, you know, <laughs> at this very moment. Um, so where was I going with that? I'm not really sure. 
Yeah, I'm not really sure. It doesn't matter, I guess. But um, I kept thinking about the journey. The, uh, yeah, the journey, journey was was worth taking. We were discovering there was there was more to bring. There was innovation. Every major Mother Nature expedition, you come back from Mount Everest, wherever it is, and you you learn. You're on a steep learning curve. Which I actually found remarkable, to tell you the truth, that you you. You don't ever write in your book, and so I guess it never happened that you thought, I, you never thought, I can't do this. You always thought, I can do this, and I just need to do X, Y, Z, and then, then it will happen. I mean, you don't go into a place of self-doubt, which I find fascinating. That's right. I think, you know, like, resolve. Who are you? Resolve. But, but yeah. that's, you, I mean, that's n not a lot of people have that. I mean, even people who finally get where they're going, you have a, an incredible amount of unbelievable, you, I think you were born that way. I think so. I really do. And I also marvel that you could have been a great swimmer, but not a great leader. And if you hadn't been born a great leader, I don't know that you could have done this. So you actually were gifted so many, so much talent to begin with. I'm not saying you didn't work really hard, but you know what I'm saying? You can be great at something, but if you can't organize a fleet of people to help you and be an amazing leader and somebody who's inspirational and aspirational at the same time and make thousands of phone calls and have the brain that can, I mean, it's really what you did is so much more remarkable than the swim. Like, it, like I'm really glad that I met you before that, so I didn't, I, I can't really get my head around it, to tell you the truth. I still, I, I wasn't on the boat, so it, I just have to love you where I love you because otherwise I, it's superhuman to me. Um, there's no question again, I failed. I'll never be Barbara Walters. <laughs> but I, I do, I just, I, you, you do see that you are, were gifted with a lot of incredible You know, things. our, thank you, Marcia. Our, our navigator, John Bartlett, who died at my age now at 66, just three months after the swim, genius, poet, um, I miss him. I miss him so much, our conversations. But he wrote me an email when it was over, and uh, it means so much to me that I put it in a uh, safe deposit box in, in the bank. And he said, all my friends are asking me why I did this. I spent four years of my life, I pretty much have gone broke. I haven't built the dream boat. He was a sort of iconic boat builder, built a one-of-a-kind boats. He said, it's sitting in dry dock. I'm so far behind. And I tell them, what's that phrase about the, the, the talking and the walking? <laughs> he said, I just witnessed somebody mm. take an unwavering, dedicated walk. Mm. And I had to walk shoulder to shoulder with her to make it happen, and you know what? I'd go broke again. Mm. And the whole team felt that way. There was, a, there was a feeling of friendship and nobility and history and, uh, and learning. You know, I was gonna say before, the two things that, that made us successful that fifth time, well, you could say three, we had a little more luck than we ever had before. I figure if, you're, if you've got the chutzpah to go at it five times, you deserve a little luck, you know? But we had, we had some new uh, technological innovations. And as I said before, you discover, you know, you go up Annapurna, you come down, the team meets, and you have, you know, technology and science, and, and you come to the next stage. And so we, you know, we weren't just ramming our heads up against the wall, feeling like, well, maybe next time we'll get lucky. We brought more to the party. And the other thing is, Tim Noakes, this scientist, he wrote me kind of a Dear John letter uh, before the fifth try, and he said, you know, it's, it's valiant that you want to try again, but I'm telling you, I'm sending you right here in this email all the empirical calculations, all the math that show you that nobody of any gender of any age, of any era, is ever going to do this swim. The, forget about the animals in the sea and the conditions, the swirling eddies and the Gulf Stream itself and the distance. Just the human body will not be able to make it through this. It can't be done. And I wrote Tim back and said, I so appreciate, you know, Tim, what we've learned from you and the <laughs> respect we've gotten from you, but you're forgetting the most critical element in this endeavor, in any endeavor that all of us 
if, if, if it's a difficult road to travel, need, and that is the power of the human spirit. You can measure me the glycogen deprivation, but who's going to measure the human spirit? We see it all the time. We hear the stories. I just watched the story of the woman who walked from Syria to Germany with her two little children. She walked the whole way. She didn't get a boat or a cab or a, a car or a train. She walked from Syria to Germany because she refuses to live with ISIS. She refuses to have bombs and terrorists going off and she won't allow her children to have not have a life. I mean, I hear stories every day. Yeah of the human spirit. And that's really what this was about. And honestly, those people, they were crying on the shore. You know, uh, Tim, Candace, Bonnie can tell you they were, they were weeping on the shore that day. And it's not because they saw someone break a sports record. They saw someone who wouldn't give up. Yeah. And they feel that for their own lives. They have dreams, they have difficulties, they have heartaches. And if they don't give up, they will find a way. You will find a way to whatever your other shore is. Oh, goodness. Thought it'd be question and answers, but not yet. Do we have more time? <clears throat> wow. <laughs> A moment of silence, very odd. Well, it's nice. It's yeah, nice. It I like nice. it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell a quick Desperate Housewives story? Oh, God. <laughs> very quick. I went over to Marsha's trailer when she was wrapping up. We've been friends a long time. Good friends. And... I went onto her set, oh and there was this magnifying glass and a paper, what do you call it? Pa paper cutter, paper yeah, opener, letter, letter opener. opener. Yeah. And Marcia said, yeah, that's one of Brie Vandekamp's, uh, you know, letter openers. It's very Tony. And she said, I'm not sure, but I think the prop manager told me that it came from Dial M for Murder, from the set, some, some famous movie set. And I said, you know, can I put in an application for it? She said, just... Just open your bag and put it in and take it out. <laughs> I don't think it happened that way. <laughs> just about, just about. Anyway, they're on my desk now. <laughs> okay, it's turning into true confession. There was this picture that I loved that was in my kitchen. And I looked at it for years, right? And then finally, it's the last day. People are, they're taking bucket loads of clothing. They're taking everything. And, you know, I've got this, I'm not a Catholic anymore, but this Catholic guilt, you know, you just can't <laughs> steal anything, right? And then finally I go, I can't take it. I want that picture. And so I take it and I put it like under my bathrobe and I get <laughs> it back to my trailer. And I'm so happy and I'm feeling terrible at the same time. And then I look at the back and it's like, Marshall's $3.99. <laughs> I still stole it and I still feel a little guilty, but <laughs> I mean, they were, anyway, back to you. All right. Um, should I ask you some of my questions? Marsha. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> well, you know, I, I thought, like in the actor's studio, you know, they asked those questions that I guess originated with Marcel Proust or something, these Proustian questions, and I thought, well, you know, um, she's not an actress, but you know, what the heck. It was good enough for Proust, it would be good enough for Diana. Mm, okay. I should say. Okay, so you ready? Yes. What's your favorite word? Epic. Mm. What's your least favorite word? I can't say it. It's a word that's in the vernacular today that's, that, that young people use and rap musicians use. It starts with a B, referring to women, and I hate that word. What turns you on? Well, I was just in a similar situation to this. In a similar situation to this, I was at AOL the other day, and they do a little rapid-fire minute, okay? So they ask you, kind of like this, quick, 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 quick. And the last question they asked me, and I'm just horrified that this came out, but um, they said, if you woke up a man tomorrow, what's the first thing you'd do? And I said, I'd make hot, passionate love with Jennifer Lawrence. 
and I was just horrified, but I think Jennifer Lawrence turns me on. I, I just think she does, yeah. Hey. <laughs> I hadn't really given it much thought. You I know, like it's a, it. It's yeah, good. It's, She's hot. What can we yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, we can't say much and about smart. that. And smart. Hot and smart. Oh, yeah. Yeah, smart, too. That letter was awesome. Okay, what turns you off? Um, gosh. You know, I think the, the, the biggest thing, there's seven billion people on the planet, okay? And roughly half, three and a half billion people have nothing. Yeah. Water, food, and three and a half, the other billion, not to oversimplify it, us, we have choices. And to me, for those of us who have choices, no judgment, it's your life, you do what you want, but inertia, doing nothing, mm. is such a crime, you know, against your life, to, to, to just let it all unconsciously kind of float by and get to the end and say, well, that was my life, what did mm. I do with my life? So it doesn't have to be epic, mm. it just has to be engaged to me. So, so when I see kids who are teenagers who are bored and depressed because they're not engaged, it just, it just makes me sad to the quick. Non-engagement. Yeah. What sound or noise do you love? I love my doggy. <laughs> I, I have a hound dog, and, and when I'm away a lot, he bays when I come home. I come home and he goes, oh, <laughs> I love that sound, and the neighbors love it, too. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? You know, I must say that getting older, and I don't know if people my age in the audience are older, feel it, but I, my hearing has become much more intolerant. You know, if I'm just walking down the street and a loud screeching, somebody's taken off the man, and in New York City the other day, someone had taken off the, uh, uh, you know, lifted up the manhole cover yeah. and dropped it back down. I mean, it just shocked me all the way through to my, to my, to my soul. Um, so I, I become much more intolerant of, of quick, abrupt, sharp noises, you know? Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like that all the time, like, so, you know, welcome to the club. Which living person do you most admire? Like you, a lot of people, uh, if you're something of a public figure, and Marsha's much better known than I am, but we're asked all the time, who do you admire? And I can come up with all kinds of names that all of us know. I admire Michelle Obama, I admire Martina Navratilova, all kinds of people. Um, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, I mean, they're literally changing the world, giving away, what is it, 90% of their wealth. But the truth is, deep down, what, what, what stirs me and, and, and makes me take deep breaths are people who you're never going to know. They just do the right yeah. thing. I have a friend named Denise Torres who, with her partner, wanted to have a child, and they became pregnant. They used a, you know... Uh, sperm donor, et cetera. And Denise, there was somebody at her job, evidently, who had walking pneumonia. And Denise became sick, and the baby became sick. Mm. And they, like most parents, were planning on having a, a chubby little infant and a fun, rascally little toddler. And they had all kinds of plans to take their child all over the world and show him her the animals of Africa, et cetera. Well, her child was born with ex an extreme level of cerebral palsy oh. and uh, two other afflictions, and she's 12 now, and she will never be leaving the home. She's not going off at 18 to college and coming back for Thanksgiving. And Denise and her partner have never gone into self-pity and weeping over it, and anybody who says to them, I'm so sorry, they say, Duh, uh, that's our, I won't say her name, that's our child, and she brings us such joy. You won't, you don't, when she encounters something that's new and joyful, we, we soar with it, and all of their lives, they're gonna be taking care of that child. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I admire Denise Torres, mm -hmm. yeah.
If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? I like to think that I become a more gracious and patient person. I think I was a, I know that I have been a better athlete in my 60s than I was in my 20s. And you say, well, how can that be possible? You know, clearly, as I said before, sports at, at a high level are for the young. But I think in ways of, uh, of immune system strength and actually brute strength, um, uh, I've, I've been better as an athlete, but a lot of the reason I was better in the ocean this time is that I was, I was more in love with the planet. Mm -hmm. I was more in awe with this life that we get to lead, and I had a perspective of how precious this life is at this age, much more than 20. I said one line in the book that I, that I, that I really felt was that I was out you know, cruising across the surface in my 20s, and barely noticing <laughs> this Mother Earth of ours. And now I'm, I'm just enthralled with her. And especially in the ocean, you know, I mentioned Martina a couple of minutes ago. And I don't know if you remember, but you know, with her storied career at Wimbledon, um, one of the greats who ever picked up a racket, on her last match ever, she knelt down on the grass and she plucked a few blades and she put them in her pocket because this was her place. This was her place of learning lessons and of losing and of triumph and of friendships, Chris Everett, lifelong friendship, et cetera. And my place is not only the ocean and the earth is fourth this ocean, but it's that ocean. Mm -hmm. When I now go to Key West or go to Havana and look out at that ocean, that's where I learned so many of my most profound life lessons. That's where I failed a number of times and had to, had to gather the character to believe that even in failure, there was a, a lot to be gained and a lot to be proud of. And it was the moment of never giving up and finally getting that, you know, that, that moment. So um, I think that, that what I've become better at, but I, but I still look to be a little less fierce day to day, because you can be fierce deep down and not have to act it out on the skin all the time. Um, I still look into become a little more of a gentle soul. It doesn't come easily to me. I see you as one of the gentlest souls I've ever mm -hmm. met. Thank you, honey. Can I say something about Cuba? It just made me think of it. We, um, our team got to go back on the year anniversary. So we finished the swim Labor Day 2013. Uh, that next Labor Day weekend, we went back to Havana. And we were in one of Fidel's um, white marble palaces. And the first time in all those years since the separation between our two nations happened, they played the Star Spangled Banner mm -hmm. and they flew the American and Cuban flags before the rapprochement mm -hmm. was announced. And we wept, we wept, the mm. Cubans wept. And I do believe, you know, we don't try to um, over-exaggerate what our swim meant, you know, to the politics and whatnot, because it didn't. But I do believe that we made a small gesture toward our two nations, human to human, not finances, not politics, not diplomacy, but just those wonderful people of Cuba and the wonderful people of the United States one day coming back together, and when the uh, rapprochement was announced by President Obama and Raul Castro last December, um, a lot of the team, we, we cried and felt that we, we were a bit a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it was always a part of the swim for me. Not, not, the yes. bit, not the main part, I agree that it was a personal drive, mm -hmm. but I, you know, you, you do these swims, as I said before, the Earth is fourth this water, so you could look at, we could spread out the charts of the Earth's surface here tonight and decide, oh, you want to swim over there? There are a number of, you know, gorgeous and historic places to swim. That's how the English Channel first came about. It was first done in 1875. And of course, there was all that clear history between the British Isles and the European continent. But Cuba, I'm not sure there's a place we could find uh, that has more, a body of water that has more historic significance to our relevant current times mm -hmm. as that stretch between Cuba and Florida. I mean, the Cubans call it the Cuban graveyard. Mm -hmm. So many people have tried to go across in small rafts in the middle of the night. Um, you know, the, the first 
time I tried in coming back after turning 60, I was in Key West, the team was all assembling, we were gonna get ready to get over to Cuba, and I went to a CVS drugstore in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep, I was just agitated, had a lot of mo high emotion running, and you know, I went out to get a pack of gum or something, and all the bright fluorescent lights, and there was only one man in the store, besides the CVS people, and he just happened to walk up to the register right before me, and he turned around, and he said to me, something is very important to you right now. Something, you're feeling something hard right now. It turned out he was Cuban. You know, a lot of the Cubans are passionate and emotional. And I said, there is something. I didn't say what it was. And he took out his wallet and he took out this crisply folded $2 bill. It had been over in fourth. So all that showed was, you know, it was like a little piece of very flat, crisp rectangle, and you saw the two. And he said, the night we left Cuba on a little raft on a windy night, not sure we'd live. I was a teenager, and my grandmother came down to the shore, and she was my favorite. And she said, I'm not going. I'm too old, and I'm not sure I'm ever going to see you again. She took me aside while everybody was getting the raft ready, and she gave me this $2 bill. And she said, an American gave me this once. And he told me that in their culture, they think this means good luck. I want you to not only have this, to make it across tonight, but to think of me. And one day, you give it to somebody who maybe needs the kind of luck you need. Mm -hmm. And I don't ever pretend we're out there with life and death, although the box jellyfish is actually, without hyperbole, a life and death moment. But I have that $2 bill now. And he told me I need to give it one day to somebody who really needs a little bit of luck. So it's, it's, I have a tenderness for Cuba, and you know, millions of people do. And I'm so happy to see. It's going to take a while, I'm sure, and none of us know what's going to happen, but if I can have anything to do with, um, like the walk that we're going to do next summer, uh, I'm planning something called Ever Walk, a walk across the United States. Bonnie and I are going to walk, and we're going to get a million people to join us. It's uh, They say today that sitting is the new smoking, and um, yeah, you know so we're good. going to get a million people to get up and move, whether it's a mile, five miles, join us. We're going to hopefully start out the Disneyland gates with 25,000 kids under the age of 14 who every day are on their screens eating bad things and have them be so proud that they took the first five miles and led us on the first ever walk ever. Well, we'd like to walk the length of Cuba, take over a thousand Cuban Americans who haven't been back to see their family since 1959, wow. and a thousand Cubans in Havana and Santiago de Cuba walk the length of Cuba shoulder to shoulder with those families back together again. So the swim was always about if the Cuba end was a part of it, the human to human touching. And I would love to be somehow again involved with you know, the furtherment of our relations mm -hmm. between the US and Cuba. <laughs> This isn't on my list, but I'm thinking, you know, of my my 91-year-old father and the woman up the street who, 104, and so I'm projecting out your life, you know, and how much time you have, which mm. is a considerable chunk of time still, and wondering, you, you think? Know, I do. I feel it's kind of speeding by. It goes, it's, gonna, it's going fast. It's going fast. I, I it's agree. fleeting. Yeah. But, but it's still a lot of time. So do you think about what you know, what else is in your future? You've, you've hit this, you know, peak, but I know you, you're, you're, you're gonna, there's, there's more. Well, I, right now I, I truly am focused on this ever walk mm. because it isn't just that summer, next summer. Mm -hmm. The vision is a legacy. The vision is every summer, and it's going to, I hope, get to be an American happening, an institution that people from other countries will say, did you, did you do that ever walk, you know, 2018? I'm, my family, we're going over and we're going to take a week, you know, because I love where they're going this year. So I, you know, besides the obvious swimming thing, I've been in good, badass shape my whole life. 
And uh, I literally, literally started young, and I just, it's my value, and it makes me feel proud, and makes me feel like I walk down the street like I own it, and, and that, I'm, that I'm capable in every other area, aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. So I just, I, I value a high level of fitness, um, as does Bonnie. And ever walk is supposed to be for everybody, all your lives, and after we do the big cross-country one, it's sort of the, you know, the, the moment of bringing attention to it. We've talked to the Surgeon General, who's a very cool guy, Dr. Vivek Murthy. He's just announced walking to become the American pastime. You know, walking is happening. Target just gave out 300,000 free Fitbits to all of their employees mm -hmm. with incentives to get walking every day. So walking is cresting, and we want to sort of bring a mass public to it and take it up to a, a wave. And that next summer, we're going to do short, short walks every, every summer for 10 summers after that. So that'll bring me to the age of 76. We're going to walk New England, let's say from Portland, Maine to New York City. The next summer, walk the Pacific Northwest from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, and then Minneapolis to Chicago. And I think, you know, I think we're going to get a million people every year to get boots on the ground, at least for a few miles at a time, and participate. And to me, that's a, that's a pretty powerful legacy to leave. Let's watch the numbers of obesity and um, heart disease and diabetes come down as we become a nation of walkers. Yeah. There's just something so sad about that we need to become a nation of walkers when you think we're put on this beautiful planet walking yeah. and that we've, we've made our lives such that we basically sit like this yeah. and that we have to undo all that yeah. sort of, I don't know. It's, it's like all the predictions. Remember E.M. Escher? He did those little drawings of, of, you know, going up stairways where people had, their bodies had shrunk, you know, and he was projecting to about our era now. And their heads were big because they were thinking like computers all the time, yeah. but there's no value to, I mean, we are such poor specimens compared to what we were physically a few centuries ago. Mm -hmm. So the idea isn't to get back to that. We never will. We're a technological people, but we can certainly move more than we're moving now. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we have two more. If you were to die, if this, maybe you won't, you know, <laughs> you can certainly will yourself not to. If you can will yourself on that swim, you can will yourself not to. I would bet on it and come back as a person or a thing, not a dog. Because I know you're gonna say a dog. <laughs> Anything but your dog. What would it be? Oh gosh, that's so abstract. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just know that when you, you know, do that dinner party game and people say, if, if you could have lived in any other era, you know, because you would think the typical one is 1920s Paris, you know, the intelligentsia. My question always is, if you could live in any other era as a man or a woman, because I certainly wouldn't want to be a woman in any other era but this one. Yeah, um, I agree. Um, and the last question is, you know, um, I know you're an atheist, and um, <laughs> you know, it's hard to be misunderstood as an atheist. You know why? Because the way I look at it is, I have no argument or debate with anybody who's religious to any degree. None. I, I, I don't know better than another individual about whether there's a God and what, what, what level of creation you believe in or afterlife you believe in. None whatsoever. I have no, I just, I, I just, you know, have too much respect for people's individual faith, you know, to, to argue any of that. I've come to a point, and I, I started in childhood with it, really, of myself not believing in a creation. But does that, does that, Differ? Does that differentiate our values in terms of the love of humanity? Um, do do we all, if you stand next to a devout Christian and a and a faithful Jew and a and a and a uh, a person of 
you know, a Buddhist or Islam faith or, you know, agnostic to atheism, if we take the whole array here, isn't above those individual readings of the Quran and the Bible, et cetera, isn't there's a, an encompassing rainbow above that of that we respect all the people who have lived on this earth, the billions of people who have loved and danced and laughed and hoped before us and who will come after us and we need to take care of humanity and respect, make sure that everybody has enough to eat and has, has meaning in their communities. So, you know, atheism to me fits right in as just one of those other belief systems that it does none of those matter for me. Let everybody have their own. Don't try to proselytize to anybody as to what yours, theirs should be compared to yours. But all of us, just for God's sake, love and respect each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you're preaching to the choir with me because I feel ex you know, exactly the same way. Um, it's too bad they didn't just have one up here because I get really frustrated with the divisiveness of religion and it's when it's not going well, let's just say, like on the other side of the world. <clears throat> um, anyway. And we're, we're in such a divisive time, aren't we? Just, I mean, just, in my life, I don't remember politically, religious, race, or we're, we're in a very, you know, well, you know we feel that negative, way, divisive you time. You read the New York Times and they say, oh, you know, it's, it's actually not true that we're just more aware of it. I don't know whether mm. that it, that's the way it is or not, but that's what they say. Like, oh, you think there's more... You know the smart people in the New York Times. I read them. I can't remember their names, but no, no, honestly, they that it's better. But it is heartbreaking. And anyway, wh what the question was, and it's not my question, was, what do you think God will say to you when you get there? What would you like Him to say, or her, or it, or? Well, I mean, as an atheist, how can I answer that? It's a, <laughs> it's a trick question. This is what I want. Um, you know, hey, honey, I helped you get across those oceans. That was me who did those little <laughs> yeah. swirlies. Yeah. No? <laughs> I, I doubt it. I doubt it. <laughs> okay. So now um, we are ready to open the discussion up to questions. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. A quick reminder, they generally start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. There are no th such thing as a two-part question, and only Marsha Cross gets to ask any follow-up questions. Hi there. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you and to Dr. Kimberly Shaw, Marsha Cross. Um, what is your relationship to the water now, as in, do you just take casual three-hour swims a day or something? <laughs> that's it. You know, I think the only swimming you know, that's that's going to be for me in the future is is twofold. One is just, you know, the, the body itself. It's a, it's a, I can't believe I ever gave it up for 30 years. I didn't swim for 30 years at one point, and um, I've rediscovered a, a way outside the extremity of the training for Cuba um, that glorious feeling, you know, of, 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 of cruising and elongating the spine and being immersed. There was a woman who wrote me, I don't know, it seems to me now it's about three years ago, she got an email address, and she told me that she was doing a film, a documentary, actually she had finished it, called Aquaphobia, and she's a New Yorker, and a lot of New Yorkers, oddly enough, don't swim. You know, you're right there with the Atlantic Ocean and you know, the whole thing, but a lot of New Yorkers don't swim. So she asked if she could come out to LA if I would just give her a couple of sound bites, and I said, yeah, you know, that sounds, sounds a worthwhile project. And I wrote her an email back, but I hadn't spelled, you know, I, I, I didn't, it just automatically did a spell check. And I wrote her that also, you know, there are a number of reasons people are afraid of the water, even though, you know, we are 98% water and the earth is four-fifths water. And, you know, there are all kinds of reasons. We, 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 babies, you see, babies at six months old have no fear because they, they I think there's memory of the floating in the amniotic fluid and all that. But I wrote her a quick email and I said, and also because of, you know, let's say Jaws, uh, there were two or three generations who were literally scared Terrifying. to death to even be in a lake, much less a... And, 
Spell check, I had put capital J and wrote out Jaws. I didn't check it afterwards. I just fired it out quickly. Spell check put Jews <laughs> instead of Jaws. And she called me and she said, you know, Diane, I thought you were kind of cool. I read your blog and everything, but I, I'm really upset by what you said. I don't think we're going to come out and do that. I said, what is it? She said, go look at the email. I said, oh. You have to believe me. I, 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 you have to believe me. I wouldn't say that. And then she was funny when she came out. You know, she said, you know, we're already blamed for everything. <laughs> and now even, even being afraid of swimming is our fault, you know. Um, but so, you know, I don't think, you know, till the day I'll, I'll die, I die, now I'm back into, even besides the exercise of it and the, and the, and the muscle and the body that it builds, just to be in the water, you know, is a glorious thing. But the truth is, I'm spending a lot of time walking right now, uh, as opposed to swimming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned some of the, a couple of people that I love also, Mr. Federer, gotta love that guy, and Martina. Um, all kinds of world-class class athletes have to have a certain mentality to get to the top but there's a very small percentage that stay at the top for Martina was playing in her 50s. Yeah. What the heck? Outrageous, yeah. And, and Federer, it, who even now makes it look completely effortless while even Nadal and other people are dealing with injuries. What do you think the difference mentally is? Because they all have to be mentally tough. They wouldn't be there if they weren't. But the sustains them over a long period of time, such as yourself, where you, you know, it's one thing to not give up in the game, the match, to, but to not give up for 30 years, 40 years. I, I, I'm, I'm with Marsha, I don't, I'm like, where the hell does that come from? <laughs> I don't get where that comes from. You know, I suppose that if, if we took most, um, you know, talents, if you looked at Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello, Federer playing tennis, that these are clearly, Barbara Streisand singing, these are clearly people who have a, have a superior genetic gift for what they do. And then on the other hand, um, I remember reading an interview with Federer once where he said, you know, you, you, he said to the interviewer, we could go and sit and watch the guy who's ranked number 500 in the world, and you would say to me, he's awesome. He, his quickness and his backhand and his topspin and his, you know, he's got it all put together. But day to day, does he have the focus? Does he have the desire? Look at Andre Agassi. You wouldn't have called him, he was quick and his footwork was incredible, but I don't think you'd call him a born, beautiful genetic talent. But he had laser focus. And I'm sure that if we, you know, were to take um, musicians and artists and you know, all kinds of people of all ilk, it comes down to a lot of people have talent. Look, you know, so look at all the wasted talent there is. We can all, the p stories have been done about the, the greatest, you know, arm in the football field ever who wasted it all, didn't have discipline, you know, didn't, didn't really want it as much. So Roger Federer is a, is an, you know, an incomparable talent in terms of your, his elegance, what you're talking about, but clearly, he has had, you know, how can he work through those matches year after year, month after month? It's because he's got a mentality that wants it. And he, he's, he's gathered together all his force to, to see it that way. Martina, Billie Jean, you know, we could name all of them, all of them who are at the top. There are, there are probably people even more talented than some of the people we've seen at the top. So to my mind, you know, people say to me too with this, with this sport, is it, is it more the body or is it the mind? Well, the body, you know, could never get through all those hours of training and that 53 hours of the last swim with just the human spirit, unless you had put in all that, that log time and made sure that no stone was unturned and that those shoulders and those lats and that, that body was, you know, ready. But once the body's ready, once Federer has taken those hundreds of thousands of strokes, then he goes onto the court with that mind of his. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating symbiosis of mind and body. Sports are. I never, I, I never give a short answer, do I, Marcia? <laughs> I love it. 
I'm over here in the middle. Hi. Um, you both said that you've known each other for a long time. When did you meet? How did you meet? And why did you ask Marsha to interview you tonight? We are good friends. You know, it makes a difference. I'm on the book tour right now, which is, you know, a different city every day for a month. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's tiring. And on the other hand, I'm so grateful, you know, the publisher believes in the book and is getting me out there to talk to people far and wide. So last night, for instance, I was at the Music Box Theater in Chicago. It's a grand theater with, you know, one of those with the, uh, you know, three-story velvet drapes and all that. And I was with a young woman on stage who happens to write for the Chicago Tribune, professional and, uh, and researched, uh, but we really didn't have a connection. And uh, it doesn't mean that the audience didn't enjoy the evening, and, and I told my stories and got it out, but each time I'd finish, you know, some, some sort of organic direction uh, instead of just a linear, why'd you do this and where were you? Um, she would say something like, well, that's terrific. <laughs> and then she'd, <laughs> she'd look at her notes and, and ask the next question, but you know, when you, when you sit and look in someone's eyes, you've known for 20 years, you can see here that we, we barely care where we're going. Um, <laughs> so there, there's a caring and a mutual respect and a, and a fondness, and it, it makes for a special evening, at least for me, you know? We, we met, we were just talking about, we met in um, somewhere around 90, 91, mm -hmm. and... Uh, it was around the time where I lost a, a, a man in my life, uh, passed away of a brain tumor, and um, it was around that time. And then I met Diana and Bonnie. I can't remember the order, except I do remember Bonnie came to the door. She'd been watching a Hallmark movie, and she was weeping. <laughs> and she's like, tough on the outside. And she's like, blah, blah, And I fell madly in love with both of them and um, have such enormous love and respect and... Um, and am, and am in awe of them. And so I feel very privileged that our paths crossed. And I was smart enough to follow that love. <laughs> and it was just about that time that Penny Marshall was casting A League of Their Own. And Marsha was reading for one of the parts. So she comes down to, you know, she knows her, her acting thing inside and out, a pro. We've, we've seen Marsha do Shakespeare on stage, just sweep you away. And, uh, but she came down to Bonnie and I, and she said, I, I got to throw that baseball. I guess so we would go out in the street with a glove. and, and totally the, forgot about the, this. The first couple days wasn't good. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, Bonnie and like, ooh, that's it. And then, but she was so determined. She came, came back to say, you know, oh, yeah? You know, and by about the fifth day, she was taking that ball bag and throwing it down the street. It was looking pretty good. Yeah. You're being so kind, I think. I, I was throwing like, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of that. There was a, a lot, lot of, of that. that. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, that's our history. So. And we were neighbors. Yeah, we lived in the same neighborhood. Anybody else? I'm on your left. Um, I don't know much about long distance swimming, ocean swimming, but you had mentioned you can't touch the boat. Right. Um, but so if a shark or, you know, if something did happen, you'd mentioned you had the team on the boat. So I mean, kind of like what's their role? Like would they be there to kind of lure the shark away? Or I mean, would you have to stop the swim? Um, kind of just what would happen kind of like, like the, like the, you know, hour to hour kind of stuff that could yeah, happen. Yeah, we had, we had a two prong sort of atta uh, attack, and I, attack's the wrong word, because we, we never kill any animal. It's, it's their territory. We use no lethal uh, spear guns, guns whatsoever. But the two kayaks, if I'm swimming here, there's a kayak off to the right and a kayak right behind me, and each of them have tethered below them a shark shield. It's about the big, uh, big as the palm of your hand. It's an electronic device, and it has a long tail of an antenna that, as we swim, sort of trails out behind the boat. And those two antennas, close to each other, emit an elliptical field of electricity under the water. And we've seen, you know, films, CNN did films, et cetera, where by uh, you put some chum, you know, some, some meat out, and sharks come up 
and, and take it quickly, and then you put the shark shield out on that chum, and when they come around, they arch the back. They, it, they have very sensitive ampullae. It's sort of a sonar points on their snouts, and that electricity is very painful for them, and they turn away quickly. On the other hand, a lot of shark experts have told us that out there in the middle of the Gulf Stream, 50, 60 miles from shore, where there are no reefs, so there's no bait fish, and sometimes a shark is not eaten for a week or two, that if you're just the innocent little swimmer going across making a low frequency vibration on the surface like a wounded dying fish, they have film of the oceanic white tip, the lemon, the tiger, the more aggressive sharks out there will come right through that electricity. So we also had divers. And by the way, how will I ever thank those guys? I mean, we're talking about we go in pitch black of night unless there's moonlight, but if it's a non-moon lit night, we use no lights at all because lights attract bait fish and they attract jellyfish and they attract sharks. You see in Tim's film, The Other Shore, he has some you know, stirring emotional footage of you, all you hear is voices. You hear voices because it's, it's so darn black out, you can't see your hand in front of your face. Often, um, you know, Bonnie and, and the group, the only reason they know I'm still swimming out there is they hear the splashing of the left arm and the right arm and the left arm and the right arm. So the divers swim with me at night. They're not allowed to touch me, but they use big, big old diver's fins, and it's tiring. When you swim underwater and you're trying to keep up with my speed going on the surface, they're working hard. They are exhausted after a certain time. So there are six of them, and they rotate in two by two by two or three and three, and the others go back to a mothership so that they can eat and rest and get ready. I like the shark divers to be rested. <laughs> no. I like, the, I like their vision to be sharp, you know? And, uh, but, but they're swimming, and if they see, you know, the, the translucent eyes of the predators below, uh, daytime, you can see them clearly. The Gulf Stream is bright, bright blue. It has a clarity and a tremendous visibility that they can see maybe a half mile away from being up on top of the boat. But at night, they have no idea. And if they, they know the animal's behaviors pretty well, and if they sense something's gonna come up, they would go with a PVC piping, kind of like a big coat hanger thing, and, and touch them. But, you know, we didn't have any, uh, you know, attacks by sharks. You know, they're always there, it's their territory, but um, it, it wasn't a, you know, the chances are they're not gonna come eat something that isn't nor normally their food. It was the box jellyfish that were you know, much more dangerous, and that could have been a, a fatal evening, really, the night I was stung by them in 2011, compared to the sharks. We've got time for two more questions, and we have one here in the center. I just couldn't pass up the opportunity of asking you a question, so um, it's not fully formulated, so forgive me, but my question is really about the time of those 30 years, that sort of gap that you had before your wake up at 60 years old. And I guess I'm wondering what you would say to yourself, knowing that this great moment was ahead of you, what would you say to your, that yourself during that 30 year gap that would keep you hopeful? Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. Hopeful about what? It's so, like I, I, meaning that you you mentioned, and I don't have the word for it, but you mentioned that you were sort of watching as an observer during that time period. But that just came toward the end. I mean, you know, from 30 to 35 and 35 to 40, and all, it, it, was, it was more toward the end, toward the end of the 50s that I was beginning, and, and, and turning 60, and my mom dying. So it wasn't that whole period of 30 years that I was despondent and feeling a spectator. I was very engaged and, uh, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great time of life. So it, it's not as if I spent 30 years in a, in a down, downturn. It was just at the very end that I got sparked, and that's what brought me back to the swim. She wasn't thinking about the swim for those 30 years. <laughs> yeah. And our final question for the evening. Thank you. Thank you for being such a phenomenal role model. I'm on your right, your far right. Oh, hi. Ah. Hi. So hard to see. Thank you for being, again, such a phenomenal role model for women, for millions of women around the United States. Thank you.
And my question is, how did you prepare for your swim? What did you do in advance? How long did you do it? Were you training every day? How many laps were you swimming every day in a pool? By the book. What were you doing? <laughs> You know, basically, it was a year-long process each year. Basically, I'd start in August and train through the winter, and we had a training camp in St. Martin. I have a number of friends down there in the Caribbean, and it's an area where there are very few sharks, um, very few jellyfish. It's warm in the winter, so you can go in January and do long swims, unlike this ocean, for sure. But even Mexico, Hawaii, um, are just a little bit too cold to do long, long hours. And it's a matter of building up. Each year, you know, in the fall, you're, you're doing eight-hour swims, and by the winter, you're doing 10-hour swims, and by the spring, you're doing 14 and 16, and each year, we would do a 24-hour swim in June, and then we'd move to Key West. Key West was the uh, center of the expedition, sort of like Kathmandu is the center of the Mount Everest Himalayan climbs. You get together, you wait for weather, you wait for the currents, it's unnerving, because you're ready and you're peaked, and sometimes it, it, we'd arrive, arrive there in early June, and it wouldn't be until late September. So that, that was the worst part. You decide each day, should we go out and do a big 12-hour training swim? But then what if I'm tired after that? And the next day, the weather you know, window yeah. comes up. It's a very fickle area of weather. We learned in this, too, that, you know... It, when you study meteorolo meteorological you know, effects around the world, one little area of the world is so affected by places thousands of miles away. In this area, Cuba to Florida, you try to picture if you're facing the map here, we're trying to go due north from Havana to Key West this way. The Gulf Stream has come catapulting out of the Yucatan Channel over here and is squeezed and flows hard to the east this way while you're trying to swim north. And this stream is going four to five times your swimming speed. And you're trying to make it up to Key West, and now the Keys in Florida drift off to the north. So every time you take a, a quick stop for a feeding or a longer stop for a crisis, you're in hallucinations, you're, you're, you're very seasick, you're, you're, um, you're suffering from hypothermia, and the medical team and Bonnie's team is dealing with you over close to the boat. Every time you're stopped and not northing toward, toward Key West, you are dragged east and east and east. In the, in the 2011 swim, when I was stung by the box jellyfish, and, and swam through that entire night the next day, stung the next night again, by that second day, John Bartlett, our navigator, came down to the handler station. We all had a powwow. I was just treading water. And he said, Diana, how do you feel about going to the Bahamas? <laughs> um, and I said, not good. You know, I, I want to go to Florida. I want to go to the United States. So um, the, that, that Key West training time of waiting, that, that east wind blows from Africa, 7,000 miles away, and that wind comes due east uninterrupted all the way across the Atlantic Ocean through the Florida Straits, and now that, that current comes up against that wind, and almost every day of the year, there are stiff peaks out there, and it's, it's, it's not an ideal day to go across. In the 30-year history um, of this particular stretch, they call it the Florida Straits between Cuba and Florida, there's one day a month there's one day a month that lays down into the doldrums like glass or goes down where the wind clocks around to the south, the southeast, the southwest, and a swimmer has a chance. Well, we need three days. We need a minimum of three if the, if the temperature's off. You can stand on the docks in Havana and put your tongue out, and you sense a crunch and you think it's the, the, the salt of the sea vapor. It's not. It's the Sahara Desert. They call oh it the God. Sahara dust that's blown all the way across the Atlantic, so it's unnerving. When we get to Key West, charming town, they were such friends to us. If you had to wait anywhere for months, um, mm -hmm. that's a great place to wait. <laughs> No, truly, truly, it was a sanctuary type place. I'm, I'm in love with that town now. But we would be there every day. You know, is, is, the, is the weather, is, is the weather going to come together or isn't it? How about the Gulf Stream? Which way is it facing? Where's the axis? And you wait for months and months. There are people trying to climb Mount Everest for 10 years. Mm -hmm. They wait and the weather socks in. They can't summit. And uh, it took us 
you know, months every year. So it's usually a year-long training and then a wait period of two, three, four months before we get a chance to give it a go. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.